I'm Tom Jode, and my wife is Linda. Our paths crossed in college when I was 23 and she 21. At that time, I was in the army pursuing a dual degree in economics and accounting, while she pursued a major in biology. My military duties were sporadic but hazardous. Our unit was tasked with discrete missions, often involving retribution against someone seemingly friendly. In essence, we functioned as assassins, with my specialty lying in planning and close combat. I graduated at 25 and two years later, I resigned from the army to marry Linda. Within four years, two daughters arrived. I worked independently, handling accounting for local businesses and trading commodities from home. Linda, busy with the kids, later secured a position at a local college-affiliated laboratory after a decade of marriage. With both girls in school, I worked from home to facilitate Linda's return to employment, which she enjoyed. We resided in the house I grew up in, having bought it from my parents when they moved to Florida. Some of our army missions offered the unit a chance at loot, which we divided among the members. Having some financial stability, we opted to celebrate one February. We went out with our neighborhood friends for dinner and dancing at a club. There were eight of us, each with a babysitter for the night. Linda and I had booked a room at the hotel connected to the dance club. She looked stunning at 5'6", slim, with brunette hair, dressed in a blue silky dress. We had an enjoyable meal and a great time dancing at the club. During the evening, a group of six entered, including Mark Stevens, a prominent local team's all-pro linebacker. He was noticed by all the women at our table, accompanied by a lovely blonde woman wearing what seemed like a large engagement ring. Our friend June mentioned she was a cheerleader for the team, engaged to Stevens. After some time, Stevens focused on our table and approached. Without acknowledging me, he asked Linda to dance. I attempted to intervene, but Linda went along without a backward glance. Annoyed, I walked to the bar, passing by them. Linda seemed indifferent as I got a coffee. After two fast dances, a slow number played, and Linda embraced Mark. Feeling irked, I walked to the bar, ignoring disapproval from the women at our table. Linda, absorbed in her dance with Mark, didn't notice. When the slow number ended, they separated, and Linda walked back to our table. I stayed at the bar, sipping my coffee. Spotting me, Linda seemed flustered and sat next to June. Approaching them, I remarked that they seemed to have had their fun though I may have gotten a bit carried away. June explained that it was just a bit of dancing, nothing serious. Feeling offended, I took a seat as June and Linda excused themselves to the ladies' room. When they returned, Linda wasn't with June. Curious, I asked where Linda was, and June informed me that she had left with Mark. Shocked, I rushed outside and saw Linda getting into a red Escalade, which then drove off. Back at the table, June addressed the others questioning if they were aware of Linda's actions. I suggested to June that she should let Linda have her night and that she would likely return the next day. Frustrated, I asserted that I didn't need Linda to come back and declared that our relationship was over when June talked to her. This proclamation caused a stir at the table, with some thinking I was too harsh. Angrily, I snapped at them, expressing my desire to have nothing to do with any of them, considering they knew what was happening but didn't warn me. As I headed towards the coat check desk, I noticed a blonde woman at the table with the others who had come with Stevens. She was in tears, so I approached and asked if she was his girlfriend. She confirmed that she was, but clarified that it was no longer the case. She revealed that they had gone to their house on Cherry Lane, and he had promised not to do such things once they were engaged. Apologetically, she mentioned that he would likely be finished with Linda by morning and would drive her home enjoying gloating at the husband. The other two guys, one black and one white, took offense, but I ignored them. I handed May my business card and told her to give me a call. Despite her tears, she smiled, and I walked away. I retrieved my coat but left Linda's, then went to the hotel room and took my case, but left Linda's. I checked out. While driving home, a fully formed plan came to me. This had happened to me while I was serving, and it's why I was alive now. It's a shame a plan hadn't occurred to me then. Before Linda left, I parked my car in the garage, engaged the security system, and retrieved a rope stored in the basement. I undressed, put on a black Under Armour suit, a black hoodie, dark gray sweatpants, old sneakers, and two sets of gloves. I also grabbed a baklava mask. Climbing up to the attic with the rope, 
I fastened it securely to a beam, as I had done in my childhood home. I climbed out of the narrow window, bounced down the side of the house, and ran through the wooded area on that side. I hopped the side fence and headed to the rear workshop. Inside, I got a backpack, extra wool socks, a pink, and an old hand axe from a toolbox. I packed everything and grabbed my bike, pedaling toward the river through the woods, across the river bridge, and up toward Cherry Street. Spotting the house with the football statue and a red Escalade, I used the axe to break the passenger side window, triggering the alarm. I hid behind a porch pillar, and when the door opened, I swiftly dealt with the man with two blows of the axe. Returning inside, I closed the front door, turned, and jogged off. I jumped the stone wall, retrieved my bike, and took the wool socks out. I put the axe, knife, gloves, and shoes inside the backpack, zipped it up, and mounted up, riding away toward the river. Near the bridge, I stopped and tossed the entire backpack as far as I could into the fast-moving river. There had been rain the day before, and the river was moving fast. Riding my bike back home through the nearby woods, I let myself inside the workshop. I changed my socks and switched to another pair of sneakers. Spraying an ammonia solution on the bike handles and pedals, I wiped them clean. Jogging back, I hopped the side fence and climbed up the house's side, which proved to be more challenging than expected. Nevertheless, I made it and scrambled through the small window. Pulling up the rope, I wound it and wiped the windowsill with a rag. Trotting down to the basement, I used the rope to remove all my clothing, including the mask and undergloves, and put them into the washer. In the basement bathroom, I showered for an extended period, washing everything twice. After completing that, I put on a pair of exercise shorts and went upstairs, leaving the basement door open to hear when the washer stopped. Contemplating for a moment, I decided to wear the clothing from the club the night before. Returning to the basement, I transferred the wet clothing to the dryer. Going upstairs, I made a snack, had a shot of whiskey, and sat for a while, reflecting on things. When the dryer stopped, I took the clothes upstairs, putting them away. The baklava mask went back into the closet where I had initially stored it. Glancing at the clock, it was 2.50 a.m. The entire sequence, from entering the house after the club to this moment, began at midnight. Going downstairs, I sat on the couch, had another whiskey, and fell asleep. I woke to the door chime, checked the door camera display, and saw two individuals, an African-American woman and a white guy with a crew cut. They were cops. The doorbell rang again, and I opened it. Detective Asper and Detective Logan introduced themselves as they flashed their badges. I was uncertain and asked about Linda, expressing my concern for her safety. They assured me that she hadn't suffered physical damage, but mentioned that Mr. Stevens had been attacked. I invited them inside and inquired about Linda's location. The white detective informed me that she was in the hospital receiving treatment for shock. Pausing for a moment, I looked at them, and they returned the gaze. Indicating the couch, I suggested they take a seat. They chose separate straight-back chairs, and I settled on the couch. I think you should explain what happened, I proposed. Detective Logan repeated the question, asking what I had done since Linda left the club with Stevens. Detective Asper responded, urging me to share the details. Insisting on an answer, Detective Logan pressed, and I explained that I had gone to our hotel room, packed my things, and driven here. I had then consumed enough drink to fall asleep on the couch. They inquired about anyone else being present, and I confirmed that the kids were with a sitter for the night. When asked if I had made any calls or sent emails, I replied in the negative, but emphasized that I had never left. Detective Asper observed the surroundings and noted the security system. Inquiring about its coverage, I offered to show them. I was here, come upstairs, I suggested. They followed me to the upstairs office, and I sat at the computer desk. Demonstrating the system, I downloaded data from 6 p.m. to their arrival. I provided them with a jump drive, explaining that the system focused on all three doors, front, side, and patio, including the sliding door to the pool area. However, the side I had come down had no door, faced the woods, and had two large windows that didn't open, lacking coverage. Logan stated they would need to confiscate the computer. I questioned the need, suggesting they might have tampered with it before arriving. Logan agreed, 
but emphasized it couldn't be gone for more than a day. I assured him I would download the same data onto an external drive. I carried out the task as they requested to look around. I allowed them, but I insisted they stay together and with me. They took some pictures and then left. It was 7.10 a.m. I informed Linda's parents, John and Stephanie, who lived in the next neighborhood over, about what had happened. They were at their lake house at the time. John was taken aback by Linda's actions, while Stephanie seemed less surprised. Stephanie asked if I planned to see Linda, to which I declined, expressing my reluctance to have anything to do with her after what she had done. I explained that the guy being attacked was a bad break, but it wasn't my responsibility. Apparently, he had a history of such behavior. I mentioned that when Linda gets out of the hospital, she needs to stay away from me in the house and we can make arrangements for her belongings. John suggested I move and let Linda stay, but I asserted that it was my house and not community property. The conversation ended, and I called my parents in Florida recounting the events. They too were shocked by Linda's behavior. My dad mentioned a headline about Stevens being attacked and executed at his home, which didn't come as news to me. The landline rang, and it was Judy. She inquired about Linda's whereabouts, having heard about Mark's pass away. I confirmed Linda was in the hospital with shock and expressed my reluctance to see her. Judy urged me to support Linda, but I insisted she would never have my support, considering what she had done. The conversation turned heated, and Judy accused me of being a pig before hanging up. I showered again and got dressed to pick up the kids from the sitter around 8 o'clock. When we got home, the kids asked about Linda, and I informed them she wouldn't be there that day. I suggested we carry on with our day getting dressed for soccer. I took them to the soccer complex for their noon and 1.30 games. I relaxed while watching them play, and afterward, we enjoyed ice cream before heading home. Upon returning, I found messages on my muted cell phone. One from Linda's parents stated she was at St. Jude's Hospital, non-communicative. Another from a doctor at the hospital requested a call. One was from Judy telling me Linda was with the police and not talking to anyone. She said I should probably cool off and bring the girls to see her. I called the girls downstairs, explaining that their mom was in the hospital, emotionally damaged, but not physically injured. They wanted to know what happened. I told them, your mom went off with a famous football player to his house to have lovemaking last night. There's no other way to say this. I thought about keeping it from you, but I figured you'd find out when she was there. Someone attacked the football guy, but apparently not her but she must have found him or something, because she is in the hospital in shock. They hesitated about visiting her, but I instructed them to get dressed, and we proceeded to the hospital. I called Dr. Laura Thompson again, who conveyed that Linda was traumatized and currently in a catatonic state. Inquired about bringing the kids, she hesitated. The doctor asked if I planned to see her, I expressed reluctance. I suggested bringing the girls if it might help. Did they know about the circumstances? referring to Linda's involvement with the football guy? Yes. I informed the doctor that the girls were dressed and ready to come if she believed it might aid Linda. She agreed to meet us at room 3 in 30 minutes. At the hospital, Dr. Thompson, a psychiatrist in her late 30s, spoke briefly with us before addressing the girls. She explained their mother's severe shock and apparent disorientation, suggesting that seeing the girls might be beneficial. The girls expressed a desire to see her. I accompanied them to the door and looked in. Linda sat in bed, staring at a TV with cartoons. Tentatively, the girls approached. Laura, the oldest, touched her hand and called her mom. Shelly followed, but there was no reaction. Shelly started to cry. I comforted her, picked her up, glanced at Linda Northing, and took Laura's hand to lead them out. I mentioned that we had tried. Laura asked if Linda would wake up. I assured her that she would eventually and suggested they might visit her again soon. Shelley whispered, asking what if she doesn't wake up. Reassuringly, I said she will. I know it. Maybe. Slowly the doctor stated, Girls, I will surely let you know when she comes back from this. We left the hospital. Both girls were crying in the car. I questioned whether I should have taken them, desiring to see if their presence would help Linda. Despite my callous reaction to her infidelity, I hadn't wished this upon her. I felt remorseful, though she deserved to suffer not like this. I felt some tears on my cheeks. Back home, I made eggs and toast for them to eat, 
intentionally involving them in the cooking to lift their spirits. Then, I put on a movie for them. In my office I called a friend, a public defender, seeking information on what happened at Stevens's house after I left. He couldn't obtain police reports, but suggested ambulance-run reports might be publicly available. I asked him to get that if possible, and we hung up. In the living room I watched the movie, pondering what might happen in an hour. My lawyer friend called back, emailing me the ambulance run, revealing a distressing situation. I shared details of the police visit. He stated that if security showed no one coming or going, I likely didn't need to worry. However, he cautioned about potential police actions and recommended a lawyer if needed. Though I believed I didn't need a lawyer, I called the recommended woman. After reviewing the ambulance report, police found Linda with Stevens's head cradled in her lap, covered in blood, dressed in a thin robe, chanting no, repeatedly. The police took her to the hospital, where she remained unresponsive. An officer had asked if she saw who did it, but she provided no response. This sickened me, making me wonder if she would ever recover. I researched PTSD, having done so before. Specifically, I explored shock-induced catatonic states, noting recovery from the catatonic state but potential long-term effects of PTSD. Lawyer Joan Drake scheduled a Monday morning appointment at 9.30, providing her cell number for early police contact, though none occurred. On Sunday, the girls and I lounged, attempting to reassure them about Linda's eventual return and acknowledging she might still need our help. I wondered about Linda's reaction to me, doubting she had witnessed anything significant. If she did, it would likely be a person in black with a mask, though assumptions were uncertain. I didn't think she had any experience with me that would lead her to seriously consider me capable of what I did. Monday, after sending the girls to school, I monitored local news coverage of Stevens's end of life. Linda's name wasn't mentioned, but it was known he hosted a married woman during the attack. Police were called by a neighbor in response to Linda's screaming. So far, no one but the authorities had connected Linda or me to the liquidation. But I thought that would change in time. Joan Drake, a nifty-looking blonde of maybe 45 years, heard the story, received the ambulance report, and was appalled. After sharing the security video's integrity, I requested my computer's return for work, providing a retainer. Joan called the police station, requesting Detective Asper for its retrieval. I had previously looked up PTSD, and for me, I researched shock-induced catatonic states. It seemed that people typically recovered from the catatonic state, but might be affected for years by PTSD. The lawyer, Joan Drake, made an appointment for me to see her that Monday morning at 9.30. She gave me her cell number in case the police came earlier but they didn't. She insisted that I had enough time to see if it had been altered, assuring me that I knew it hadn't. I agreed, stating, Okay, I'll send someone tomorrow morning to get it from you. No, I'll send someone from the office. I shook my head, indicating he won't be coming. She nodded in understanding. Okay, he'll be there, nine o'clock. When she was off the phone, I conveyed to her that I wouldn't talk to the cops and that I'd have a phone with me to record the discussions, if any. I departed that afternoon. Upon the girls' return from school, they immediately inquired about Linda. Earlier, I had contacted the doctor, but there was no significant change. They dove into their homework, and later, we ordered pizza. Jokingly, I mentioned that if their mom didn't return soon, I'd have to learn how to cook, which elicited laughter. However, I'm actually quite skilled in the kitchen, just not accustomed to cooking at home often. When Laura's sister went upstairs, Laura inquired about my willingness to forgive mom for her involvement with another man. I responded that, at the moment, I simply wanted her to get better. Shortly after, the landline rang, and Jim Beeman from the newspaper identified himself as being from the Trib. He conveyed, We have information suggesting it was your wife Linda, who was with Mark Stevens when he was executed. Can you confirm that? Expressing a preference for the matter to remain private, I elaborated on the potential consequences for my two youngsters in school. Jim proposed, maybe if that information were to come out. Reluctantly, I confirmed it and was questioned about my feelings regarding the pass away of my wife's lover. Acknowledging the situation, I stressed that any damage to my family resulting from their publication would lead to legal action against him and his paper. Jim asserted, this is going to come out, Mr. Jode. I can't prevent that. 
Observing a TV truck parked in front of the house through the window, Channel 7, I conceded, I see a TV truck. I suppose you're right. Sorry, I have to go. A knock came at the door, and checking the camera feed, I noticed a young woman with a microphone. I communicated over the intercom. Leave, you're trespassing, and I will call the police. Is your wife there, Mr. Jode? I called the local precinct and requested assistance in removing the press from my front porch. They responded, dispersing the group of six people, but the trucks remained, totaling four. Next, I called the doctor and urged her to secure Linda before the press invaded. I also discussed relocation and adjusting the girls' schooling with them. However, they insisted on continuing to attend their current school, even if they had to live elsewhere. I said I'd consider it. I contacted my lawyer Joan seeking advice. She agreed to issue a statement to the press to alleviate the situation. The statement, issued through her office, expressed our desire for privacy, stating no comment on the rumors about my wife and no future comments. It warned that the media's continued presence outside the house would be actionable if it damaged the family and requested the trucks to leave. Meanwhile, Detective Asper and her commander announced a press conference for 7 p.m. Watching it, the police disclosed that Mark Stevens had been attacked and executed with a sharp object outside his home. Although a woman was inside the house at the time, there was no indication that she witnessed the attack. The investigation was ongoing. The initial query revolved around the woman's marital status and whether her husband was a suspect. Detroit Rasper remarked that, given everyone knew her name, it was assumed she was married. He stated a thorough investigation of the husband revealed no indication of his involvement in the attack. In fact, he appeared to have been at home all night. A reporter, situated some distance from the scene, inquired about other women, particularly married women and their husbands. The police acknowledged systematically investigating claims of Mr. Stevens seducing married women, finding some truth to it. Stevens seemed to have taken several married women while their husbands were present, prompting further investigation. Commander Johnson interrupted, concluding the proceedings, and announced that any additional information would be shared before the Wednesday briefing. The police departed amid shouting, I arranged with the girls' school to have their work delivered or sent electronically for the next few days. I called Linda's parents, advising them to be wary of the press, though none were present, at least for now. They had also vanished from our street. On Tuesday, the doctor called, reporting Linda's responsiveness, and the police were with her. I informed her parents and took the girls to the hospital. Upon our arrival, the police were just leaving. Detective Asper expressed a desire to talk to me, and after meeting with her, I agreed. Linda appeared dazed, exchanging greetings with the girls through smiles and hugs, but her acknowledgement of me seemed minimal. The girls provided updates on the TV trucks and school, yet Linda appeared to drift off, prompting the doctor to suggest letting her rest. While her parents conversed with the girls, I engaged in a conversation with Detective Asper. Asper remarked that she seemed to be recovering. I responded, stating that maybe she was, but I didn't really know. I asked if he planned to take her home until she recovered. Asper mentioned that after her recovery, he was sure they would be separated. I suggested that he should give her a break and questioned what more punishment she could receive than what had already happened. I clarified that for me, it wasn't about punishment, but about respect and trust. I expressed that I would never trust her and I would never respect her, noting that the feeling might be mutual. Asper smiled, suggesting that she might fear me and I might not be trusted either. He accused me of trying to provoke him, stating that he knew he had nothing to do with Stevens getting attacked. He acknowledged my army background and formidable reputation in the service, speculating that maybe a regular guy couldn't have done it, but perhaps I could have. I insisted that I didn't, emphasizing that we had home security footage from Stevens's house. Asper dismissed it as not his problem, asserting that he wasn't there, and concluded with a veiled threat, saying he'd be seeing me around. In the next few days, Linda gradually exhibited normal behavior. I took the girls daily, but didn't spend much time in the room with them. On the fourth day, Linda was set to be discharged. She requested a private conversation with me, and I sent the girls out. She apologized for her actions, acknowledging that embarrassing me like that required more than a simple apology. 
Linda expressed her desire to come home when released. She noted the media presence and their potential disruption to the girls' lives, suggesting she could sneak out. I gave her a long look, stating that she was good at sneaking out. She didn't look up and mentioned checking with security. I acknowledged that I couldn't say I wanted to be around her, but for now, I had little choice. I expressed that I didn't mean for her to be hurt and shared my thoughts on her actions. When asked about whether Stevens had slept with her, Linda replied that they were undressed in bed when the commotion started. I stared at her and knew she was lying. I couldn't say I believed her or would believe anything she told me. Trusting her again was out of the question. I suggested that we see how things go, but made it clear that I couldn't trust her again. Despite all this, I expressed my love for her and walked out. Later, I went to the hospital security office to arrange for a car to pick Linda up behind the building and take her to my house at 4 p.m. The plan went off without a hitch, and she arrived home around 4.45. The kids and her parents were there with me. I had set up a bed in my office for myself, while Linda would sleep in our room. The rest of the day was very awkward. Linda, her mom, and the kids played Monopoly in the living room. Her dad and I went to the patio to talk. John asked what I was going to do. I admitted that I didn't really know, but the odds were that we were finished. I encouraged him to try to forgive, emphasizing the long history of love between them and their wonderful family. John expressed doubts about their long-standing love, questioning Linda's actions. He was particularly troubled by the fact that she said they didn't have closeness. I acknowledged her statement, but emphasized the uncertainty, given the amount of time they spent together. I suggested it might make a difference if protection wasn't used and raised concerns about potential consequences like diseases or pregnancy. John didn't find the thought pleasing and agreed to let Linda stay for the time being, but advised me to find another solution soon. We returned inside, ate pizza, and her parents went home. As far as I knew, they did not discuss the Mark situation with her. While putting the girls to bed, Laura asked Linda why she went to have lovemaking with Mark. Linda apologized, admitting her weakness and wrongdoing. Laura expressed confusion about Mark, stating he wasn't their daddy and promised to discuss it later when she knew more. The girls went to bed and Linda went to the kitchen. I followed about 10 minutes later, making a call to my public defender friend about the autopsy report. He confirmed it was a public document and agreed to get it. Linda, drinking a Pepsi, asked if I would be sleeping in our room. I replied, no, the office. She welcomed me any time but acknowledged the uncertainty in our future. I expressed skepticism and she suggested being patient emphasizing that it all happened in the past week. I climbed up to my office and went to bed, but didn't sleep well. I woke up at 5 a.m., made coffee, and received the autopsy report from my friend. Reading it carefully, especially the analysis of the injuries, revealed evidence of ejaculate and female secretions on Stevens's phallus and scrotum. It seemed Linda had lied about not having closeness, a belief I held due to the timing of her presence at the scene, about two hours before the exterminating. When she descended, we got the girls off to school, almost like usual. They were a bit subdued, though. While driving them, I spent a good amount of time reviewing my options. If it hadn't been for Linda's illness, I would never have allowed her back into the house. But there were advantages to that, including making things a little easier on the girls if things settled down. Just as I entered the house, another TV truck pulled up outside, and a young woman got out shouting if Linda was at home and if I forgave her. I smiled, waved, and warned her not to come onto the property. I went inside. Linda had made some biscuits and offered me one, which I took. She informed me about a TV truck outside, expressing uncertainty about whether they knew I was there and suggesting that maybe they shouldn't. I inquired about what the TV crew wanted, pointing out that they had already published my name and details about my activities at Mark Stevens's house. Linda questioned if they could cause more damage, and I acknowledged that they probably could think of something. I looked at her, contemplating what to do. She questioned if I meant about her or about us. I clarified that I wanted her to write down exactly what happened last Friday, from when the confrontation occurred until she ended up in the hospital. I suggested it didn't have to be immediate, but I wanted it soon if possible. Linda agreed to try, acknowledging that it might be traumatic, and mentioned the need to call work to check if she still had a job. 
I questioned why her job would be at risk for cheating on me, expressing doubt that her workplace would care. She explained she had been off for a week and called her workplace. They allowed her to put the week on sick leave and the next week on vacation time. She then went to her bedroom typing on her computer. I left her alone and went to my office, where I started researching the autopsy material. I ensured that I would receive the results of the tests done, but it might take a few more days. Despite the situation, Linda seemed to be attempting to behave normally around me. I acknowledged this, but believed she must have questions about what happened. Our routine continued for two days until I got the test results from the autopsy. Linda's DNA coital secretions were identified on Stephen's phallus, so she lied about the lovemaking for sure. I was waiting to see what she wrote to me about what happened, but I just couldn't see continuing life with her as my wife. After dinner the next day, Linda came into my home office. I finished writing here. She handed me a printout. I read what she wrote. Linda apologized, expressing regret for her weakness. She recounted the events at the party, explaining that when Mark asked her to dance, she felt thrilled due to his captivating presence and reputation. While dancing, she didn't think of anything else. During a slow number, she found herself at his mercy, pulled to him, and felt his size and hardness. She admitted that at that moment, she would have slept with him right there, captivated by his attractiveness. Mark suggested slipping out the side door to go to his place, promising her the coital experience of her life, a proposition she believed. When the dance ended, and I wasn't at our table, she arranged to go to the women's room with Jay. When I returned, she could sense my anger, but thought I would get over it in time. Desiring Mark, she went out the side door, and they drove to his house. Mark kissed her, carried her upstairs to his bed, and they slept together. She cleaned him and performed another closeness act, but a car alarm interrupted them. Mark left, instructing her to wait. Looking out the window, she couldn't see over the porch roof, but noticed someone in black running away and jumping the fence. Linda found a robe, went to the front door, and discovered Mark lying in the driveway with a bashed-in head. She felt guilty, as if it was her fault for sinning. The police arrived and she ended up in the hospital. She apologized for everything, expressing love and confusion about her actions. I looked up at her, tears streaming down her face. She asked if I was the person she saw. I clarified that I was at home all night, drinking and regretting the end of my marriage and the changes that would come to my family. I admitted to having hate, but assured her that the police confirmed my presence with the security tape. She acknowledged what they said, but I interrupted expressing my belief that Stevens got what he deserved. She disagreed, saying he didn't deserve that, and emphasized that he was nice and had an impact on my life. I replied that we didn't need to go there, stating that I would never be able to love her again, maybe not at all. I pointed out that the person I thought I married would never have done what she did. I questioned if the lovemaking was worth what was lost, for both of us. I acknowledged that the lovemaking was spectacular, but not worth the consequences. I reflected on the possibility of coming home the next day if things had been different, but with Stevens dead, I felt screwed up for good. She affirmed that I executed him and promptly ran out of the room. Under my breath, I muttered that she executed him. Following that, our relationship turned extremely cold. I made a firm decision not to attempt to convince her of my innocence or to mend our relationship in any manner. I also resolved never to admit to her what had transpired, as I assumed that, if I did, she would immediately betray my trust to the authorities. She had just admitted that, had Stevens not been executed, her reckless night would have been worth facing the consequences, maybe not in those words, but still. I filed for divorce. A few weeks later, I asked for custody of the kids so they could stay in the house. Linda still had her job, so I asked for no alimony but also no child support and liberal visitation. Linda had recovered sufficiently that I insisted that she move out. She went to stay with her parents. I had her served there. Soon after, her father called. He wanted me to withdraw the papers, said Linda was distraught. I told him that she deserved to be distraught and she should get a lawyer. He was quite angry, but I didn't know if he was angry with me or her. He inquired about visitation and I informed him that she could come over any night and stay until they went to bed. Linda visited the next day at 5 o'clock. 
I had prepared macaroni and cheese, and we ate with the girls. We played board games with them and put them to bed. After that, Linda expressed a desire to talk, but I declined. She insisted that we needed to work things out for the sake of the girls, suggesting that they would have to adjust if we were apart. She proposed finding a place where they could visit, emphasizing that the sooner we worked out the divorce, the sooner I could have a visitation schedule. She pleaded, expressing regret for her mistake and professing her love. I rejected the idea, stating that there was no way we would stay married after her open involvement with that man. I made it clear that it was time to move on. Linda began to tear up, quietly crying. Despite feeling some sympathy, I was not sorry enough to change my mind. Our marriage was over. The divorce went through. We worked out a joint custody agreement, and Linda had an apartment with a big second bedroom for the girls. The two of us settled into a distant but amicable relationship, focused on the girls. After about four months, I began to date women from our circle and from work, knew that I was unattached, and I seemed to attract their attention. When Linda had the girls, I brought several women home for the night. None of them lasted too long, though, but the lovemaking was usually good and sometimes great. I stayed away from married women, although some of them seemed anxious to be with me, but after my experience, I thought it immoral to do that. Linda was good with the girls, and not so good by herself. She was taking antidepressants and sleeping a lot, but she managed to go to work and do her job. I was told by her parents and the girls that she was not dating. Ten years on, Shelly went off to college today. Laura was to go to her junior year. The two of them had gotten used to the joint custody arrangement and seemed to do quite well. They both dated in high school and presumably in college. For Laura, I've had a long-term relationship with a younger woman named Cody, whom I met at a bar one night. Like me, she was divorced, with two children at home, and her husband had moved to the West Coast. We met when she was 35, and her kids were in high school, twins in their sophomore year, heading off to college. She and I moved in together at my house. I loved her. She was lively and smart, and the lovemaking was great. While she might not have been as much of a beauty as Linda, she was pretty, and guys paid attention to her when we went out. I informed her early on about all the commotion surrounding Mark Stevens's pass away, without revealing how he had died. The publicity eventually subsided, and no one was ever arrested or charged. One Saturday, Detective Logan showed up at my house, and I invited him in. I was home alone. He mentioned his recent retirement and expressed his happiness about the good pension. I congratulated him and asked why he was there. He admitted that he became convinced I executed the man, adding that the man deserved it, though maybe not my wife. I denied any involvement, and Logan congratulated whoever did it. I questioned why he thought Linda didn't deserve it. Logan explained that it was just one night, and Linda did what many married women might do when someone came on to them. He suggested that if it had been a discreet meeting, perhaps we could have gotten over it, but it was too in our face. I inquired about his partner, and he shared that she was now a captain, a real go-getter. We shook hands, and he left. Regarding Linda, she eventually made a partial recovery. We rode together when I took Shelly to school. On the way back, I asked about her well-being. Linda mentioned she was okay and had a boyfriend, somewhat like a friend with benefits. I confirmed that Cody and I were together, and we might move in together once her kids went off to school. Linda whispered that she wished none of it had happened, expressing regret for the missed opportunity to be empty nesters and have some real fun. She apologized, and we both ended up crying. Later, she moved into her friend's apartment, but I didn't think she ever fully recovered from that night and perhaps I hadn't either. I admitted to never regretting dealing with the man, believing it might have saved many marriages, an effective altruistic deed.